Let's just take one minute and close our eyes. Sit upright, be relaxed, poised, attentive. When we feel comfortable in the universe, we know that the forces of nature support and nurture us. All emerging circumstances and events, God's grace that is unexpected good for our own benefit are all with us at all times. So we feel comfortable, centered, grounded, balanced in this moment. And we are so grateful for all of the many, many blessings that we have. And so if you'll chant Om with me one time. Oh. Peace. Good morning. I hear sound. Amazing. There is energy come back. I want to start off by just taking a selfie here. Uh, our, our spiritual grandfather, great-grandfather, Sri Akeswarji, uh, used to, when, before he became a Swami, his name was Priyanath Karar, and he uh, went, he taught, and he had seminars and workshops, and he moved around North India, uh, educating people, teaching people about their spiritual unfolding path, about how to wake up to God and self-realization. And he would refer to everyone who came as Sri Yukta or Sri Yukti. Sri Yukta, Sri, radiant, shining, brilliant, Yukta united with part of the wholeness of this expressive reality. Everyone was a beautiful, radiant being. And this is how he would refer to people, Sri Yukta, Sri Yukti. And so when he became a Swami, the name that he was given was Sri Yukta Ishvara, the radiant one who is one with this intelligent, organizing, ordering principle of expression. Shri of Teswar. And so it's so wonderful to be here with all of these beautiful Sri Yuktas and Sri Yuktis. And it's an honor to be invited and to be able to, to uh, share with you and to be shared with because it's really we're all in this together, right? So this is a little dance, a little conversation that we have with one another. And uh, because Mr. Davis couldn't be here, uh, he's here, but he's just not here, here, you know, uh, because he couldn't join us. I thought it might be useful to just talk a little bit about his life and his ministry and how he, his process and uh, unfolding um, consciousness, you know, how this worked for him. So he started off, he was born in Ohio on a farm in 1931. And by the time he was 18, uh, he had uh, contracted rheumatic fever. So he spent most of his, high, his senior year in high school in bed, not allowed to get out of bed at all. He was bedridden for month, many, many months. But during this time and just before that, he had been very interested besides his, in his horse and being a cowboy, you know, a young farm boy, uh, he was very interested in in yoga, he, he would get books in a in little town in Ohio, in, in, out in the middle of the farm country, he would find books in the library there at school on Hatha Yoga. And the fellow who brought the bookmobile around would bring him books on, he knew he was interested in on yoga. And so, uh, so he was interested in reading about these things in high school. And it's sort of, it was sort of an interesting correlate because uh, Paramahansa Yoganandaji, when he was young, when he was in high school, 
you know, he and his friends would sneak out at night, like high school boys will, and they would go sneak off so they could go meditate. Spend the night meditating, sneak back in in the morning before mom and dad wake up so they wouldn't know that they were out. And they, uh, and they would go... <clears throat> They would go do everything possible. They would chant all night. They would read the Bhagavad Gita. They were so enchanted, so involved in this spiritual process. This, this awakening uh, impulse within was so strong within them. And so it was with Mr. Davis. So even though he's bedridden, he's reading and reading. And then in a physical culture magazine, because he's skin and bones. I mean, he's been in bed for months as an 18-year-old boy. Um, and so he would re read about the muscle men and, you know, physical culture. In the back of a physical mu culture magazine is an ad for autobiography of a yogi. Wow. So he sends off his $2 or whatever it was for a hardcover book back then and gets this book in the mail and reads it and reads it and reads it and just feels this connection, this heart connection. So then... Uh, just after he turned 18, uh, the doctor gave him permission to get out of bed, finally. Uh, he had graduated high school sort of by remote control. The, the doctor said, you can get up and start to move around. This day, his mother passed. Wow, that's intense. So, and this was early. This was in, probably in June or so. So he spends the next few months kind of taking care of his father, cooking, and of course, working on the farm. There's plenty to do. Uh, and by the end of the, of the summer and early fall, September or so, uh, part of him, you know, he's an 18 year old kid and he's getting tired of taking care of dad, you know, cooking and, and being on the farm. But he's also tired of uh, the cold, snowy winters in Ohio. And he said, I'm, I'm not gonna go through another winter here. And, and there's a bigger world out there. And he had this feeling, this calling to go and be with Yogananda. So this was, you know, literally a calling. Um, and so he left home. He had, I think he said he had about $20 that he'd saved up from his allowance. And his father agreed to pay to give him, to loan him sort of $40 for his saddle. He said, well, I think I can sell that to the neighbor. So he leaves home in Ohio with $60, gets a bus ticket, and the first thing he can think of to go, first place he can think of to go is warm, that's Florida. So he takes a bus to Florida and uh, gets a job in a restaurant, you know, like a short order cook for a little while. That didn't work very well. Then he sees an ad in the newspaper, make big money, you know, be your own person and and so he signs up with this outfit that is going from town to town selling magazine subscriptions. Good way to make your fortune. And so the fellow that's running this business has several young men like him, and they go out canvassing door to door, knocking on doors and trying to sell magazines. <laughs> and he said, after about a week of that and not, no sales, that was very frustrating. And of course, being rejected several times a day is not very good for your self-image. Um, and he knocked on the door of one house and this woman said, well, son, come in, it's hot, come on in here and have some cookies and milk, you know, just to get off the street for a minute. And then she showed him to, and then he told her, she'd ask him, well, what are you doing? What are your plans? And he said many of the other uh, young guys would say that they were in college because this was a good way to get somebody to buy a magazine subscription, whether it was true or not. Um, and so he said, well, my aspiration is to go to California and to be with this Swami. And she said, oh, that's wonderful. So she takes him in the back and there's a uh, study there, a library. And she said, this belonged, this was where William Walker, what? William Walker Atkinson would write when he would come down here and spend his winters in Florida. William Walker Atkinson was uh, quite a big name in New Thought. Matter of fact, the International New Thought Alliance was named by him. So he was, you know, quite a positive mental attitude, uh, New Thought kind of person. 
but he also wrote books under a, uh, his pen name, which was Yogi Ramacharakra. And Yogi Ramacharakra wrote a series of these books on yoga as though he was a yogi. And so this woman said, well, this was, you know, where Yogi Ramacharakra would write. And, uh, and she said, you know, what he would say if he was here is if your dream is to be in California, then you should go. Why are you? Why are you hanging around here selling magazine subscriptions when your future is out there? So he said. He said. Well, this was kind of a light bulb going on. Yeah, I. You know, I got it. I got the message. So he went back to the manager of the uh, the magazine subscription guys and said, "You know, I've been thinking it's time for me to move on." And he said, you know, I've been thinking the same thing. (laughs) So he took off with his suit. You know, he had a nice suit and a little suitcase. That's all he had. And about $5 left in his pocket. He'd been for a couple of months in Florida. Took off hitchhiking across the country from Florida to California. And I think he said it made it in about four days. Got long rides and... And landed in Los Angeles and uh, spent the first night at one of the missions, you know, the places where homeless people go, the Salvation Army, something. Uh, Spent the first night there because he wanted to sort of be grounded before he went to to meet uh, Paramahansa Ji. And uh, so the next day he went and got to the, excuse me, the base of uh, Mount Washington and uh, had a ride all the way to the top. And walked in, and this was Christmas Eve. And Christmas Eve was a day when they had an all-day meditation, like a six-hour meditation. Uh, And so he was, you know, brought in and shown to a place. And he says, there's no way I could sit for six hours and meditate, but I could sit there and look at the, you know, the beautiful gurus on the front altar and... Uh, and this be- this environment was just so rich and so juicy, and it was just you know for for a kid that just came off the farm in Ohio and hadn't been ever been more than fifty miles from home. This was amazing, and so he was very much taken with this. And then he they arranged a, an interview uh, with uh, Paramahansa Yogananda, and and he said, I you know my thought was when I sat down with. Yogananda Ji, that he would say, my son, you finally arrived. I've been waiting for you. But he said, uh, you, do your parents know you're here? And he said, yeah, yes, sir. <laughs> it's okay. And he said, uh, and, and of course, he asked if he could stay. And you know, the next thing that Yogananda said, you know, this is not a path of escapism. This is a, you know, this is work and this is... Uh, a process that you have to be involved in. He said, I know, sir. And he said, he said, okay, uh, you can stay. And so that was his, his beginning. And a couple of years ago, I asked Mr. Davis, I said, you know, you've told the story many times, but you, uh, did you have a plan B? You've got, I mean, you hitchhike all the way across the country. By the time you had got there, you didn't have any money left. He made his way up to the top of Mount Washington. And what if Yogananda had said, no, you're really, you know, you're not quite right. Come back later. Um, what, was there another option? Did you have a plan B? He says, I never thought of that. It never occurred to me that I wouldn't be there. This was, you know, this was a calling. This, I felt this connection. So, so he was there and, and uh, uh, Donald Walters Swami Kriyananda was the senior monk. He had been there about a year before Roy. And so he was sort of the one that organized the monks and assigned the work and he took care of that. So so he saw to getting a place for Roy to stay and, uh, you know, assigning him some basic tasks around the the ashram there in Mount Washington. And uh, after about a month, I think a month, maybe two months at the most. Uh, Yogananda had called for Roy. He said, okay, we need, need to see you. 
As a matter of fact, he said, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be back tonight. He says, wait for me downstairs at Mount Washington. And Yogananda would go out and he had a driver and he would meet people. And so, <clears throat> so this evening, Roy is sitting down there and he's waiting for, for Yogananda Ji to come and waiting and waiting. And nine o'clock goes by, 10 o'clock goes by, 11 o'clock goes by. And he says, finally, I thought, well, he's forgotten me. And so 11 o'clock, he, he goes off to, to the dorm and goes to bed. So the next day, uh, the head monk comes to him and says, uh, Yogananda came in last night and he was looked for you, ask about you first thing. <laughs> and you aren't there. And he said, oh, no. So, so he said, the next night, Yogananda said, please, you know, I'll meet you down here. And so he vowed that he would stay there for days if it took <laughs> whatever. Um, and so Yogananda, called, when he finally came, Yogananda called to him, called him to his room, and he said, I have, uh, he said, will you do what I ask? And Roy said, yes, sir. He says, well, I have plans for you. And uh, we have a, a new project in Phoenix. Uh, we started a, a goat dairy, and uh, we need some help. And so, uh, so tomorrow you'll go to the goat dairy and start helping them. And he thought, of course, because, because number one, Roy had been raised on a farm. He was a perfect person to work on the goat dairy. And number two, the weather was good there for his recovery. And so the next morning, he packed his bag and he was on his way to Phoenix, Arizona to work on the, the goat dairy at the SRF Center. And Yogananda said, come back and see me every 60 days, every two months, come back. And so he would take a bus and go back and wherever Yogananda was. And in those days, this was two years before he passed. So in those days, he was spending a lot of time out in uh, 29 palms uh, and writing and working on this Bhagavad Gita uh, uh, commentary. And so Roy would take a bus either to, to Mount Washington or out to 29 palms and spend a few days with Yoganandaji and then go back to Phoenix. And so this was his life. And he said it was wonderful, wonderful, because I didn't have to be in the middle of all the stuff and all the opinions. And yeah, these, you know, these were all monastics. These were all monks. These were all people who were dev uh, devotees of Yoganandaji and we're all meditating, but they all have opinions and they all talk too much. And they, you know, and there's all this distraction. So he loved the fact he was, he's a very uh, naturally reclusive person anyway and uh, not very gregarious and outgoing. He's kind of, you know, quiet. And so he really liked the fact that he had his own space and he could sit and meditate and be quiet, show up for his work. And the other fellow who was the senior monk, out, that was the, the priest there, um, he was also very quiet and very naturally monastic. So they just kind of, they wouldn't even spend time together. They would maybe have lunch together. But besides that, Roy had his work, and and the other fellow had his work, and they would just, uh, you know, were in their own space. So Roy said that he had an opportunity. Then he would meditate for about eight hours a day, a few like three hours in the morning, hour or so afternoon, and another three or four hours in the evening. And this wasn't just sitting and meditating and, you know, struggling and working on it. It was sitting, chanting a little bit reading a little bit, meditating, reading a little bit. The first instruction that um, Paramahansa Ji gave him uh, after he accepted him, he said, read a little, meditate more, think about God all the time. This is it. Read a little, meditate more, think about God all the time. And so he had a chance, an opportunity to practice this for the years that he was there. And he heard later feedback. Uh, one of the monks had asked Yogananda, he said, you're sending Roy away. He's only been with us for two months. He hasn't had a chance to really get grounded in what we're about and, uh, you know, and to get educated. And, and Yogananda said, you leave him alone. You leave my boy alone. I know. <laughs> I know what I'm doing. <laughs> so, so Roy had a chance to really be 
introspective, to be quiet, to be grounded, and to practice, practice, practice um, in those early days. And of course, going back and spending time with with Paramahansa Ji, and it would be very personal. I mean, he would go out to Twenty Nine Palms, and and uh, Yogananda would say, well, "Let's go for a walk." He would walk around his compound. He had like a little path around the inside of the fence, and so they would just walk and stroll, and and then they would talk. And Roy said, "I would always on the bus on the way over, I would always be." doing my kriyas and, and uh, meditating and getting, as the, as the Christians would say, getting prayed up. So, so when I got there, he would see that I was bright and clear. And, and, uh, and so then he would uh, spend time and, and he said, and I, I never went with questions. I didn't have questions. I, I, I just sort of knew, I knew what he would answer. I knew what he would say. I mean, between the intuition and between reading some of his works, it's like, yeah, I, I got that. He said, I never really went with questions much. I just went to be in his presence. But there is this energy, he said, um, just sitting there. He's so grounded, so grounded, so anchored, so centered, so balanced, that just being in his presence was transformative, right? So, um, so he said, I would just go there and and to be with him, and, and we would just chat, just talk, or just spend time, just walk together. He said one at one point he they were walking and and a question occurred to him. His question just came up in his head. He said, he said, uh, Master, in your autobiography, you have many stories of saints, you know, great saints and amazing uh, beings from India. And he said, How many of those are fully liberated now? How many of the people that you wrote about are fully liberated? And he said he didn't even stop to think about it without just without even thinking. He said, "Oh, not many, not many. Many saints are they're they're satisfied to just move into the experience of God realization of this pleasant, balanced, harmonious experience, and to stay there." Okay. And then Yogananda said, "He said Yogananda." turned to me and he said, but you, you must go all the way and you can do it all the way in this lifetime and you can do it. This is what he encouraged his disciples, what he talked about personally and of course the example that he set. And so, and so this was, mis this was the, the instruction, the direct instruction from his guru was do this, right? Practice and go all the way to self and God realization and liberation of consciousness in this lifetime. And you can do it. And I know uh, a couple of years ago, there was a conversation with another one of Roy's students who said, you know, there have been, we've had several of our people have passed just in the recent time, you know, within a few months. And, uh, and he was asking if we were going to have a special service or something for one who had just passed it when we were in Italy at the Kriya Yoga Congress there. And uh, Roy wrote back to him and he said, he said, these things remind us that life is short and we should focus on important matters while we can do so. So, and this is, this is how he lived. This is what he did. So, so when Yoganandaji passed uh, in 1952, um, they actually, they called him and said, oh, you, just, you know, Roy, Yoganandaji just passed this evening. And uh, so Roy did the first memorial service in Phoenix the next morning at uh, the Phoenix Temple because the senior minister was already back at headquarters and had been there at the, at the banquet that evening uh, when Yogananda passed. And so they called Roy and said, tomorrow morning you do, the, do a memorial service for the group in Phoenix and then come over here. Um, so he came, he did the first you know, service, then he came back to headquarters. And then uh, a couple of days later, um, Faye Wright, who, who became... Uh, Diamata, they right called him into the office and said, "Here is your uh, or your certificate of ordination." 
So this is, makes you an official minister of SRF. And of course, he wasn't allowed to be a minister in California until he was 21 years old. And so Yogananda had already ordained him previously, but he couldn't have had the paperwork, couldn't have the signed thing uh, until after he was 21. So right after he passed, he was uh, made officially a minister. But before that, in 1951, on one of his trips back to see Yoganandaji, and he was there with uh, the fellow who was the senior minister at Phoenix and another one of the uh, monks from SRF. They were at Mount Washington upstairs, uh, right outside of Yoganandaji's room. And to, before they left, he was sitting down. And he said, he said, come here. And he had Roy kneel down. And Roy said, he put his hands on my head and he said, uh, I ordain you as a minister of self-realization fellowship. Teach as I have taught, heal as I have healed, and initiate sincere seekers into Kriya Yoga. And, and this was his blessing. Well, one of the, one of the other monks who was standing there said, Sir, is, did you say that Roy could initiate? This wasn't, this wasn't a common thing that he did. And Yogananda said, yes, of course, you too. He said, the same God that's in me is in you, and you should do what I do. And so this was his, his injunction to Roy and to the other minister that was, that was present at the time. And so he was... Uh, authorized, and, and Roy said, and I knew at the time I was not prepared for this responsibility. I knew he was doing this for the future because he could see this uh, in, in my future. And so, so then after Yoganandaji passed, um, he was assigned to be the minister of the Phoenix Center, and so he was by himself there for another two years, and he said, this was so wonderful because I was by myself, you know, and, and I didn't go anywhere. He didn't have a television or a radio. Uh, he said once a week, I would have to go into town to get some supplies and food, but otherwise he was by himself alone. And this was a wonderful blessing for him. The goat dairy had, had come and gone to turned out to goat milk was, uh, even though it's a very healthy thing, it was just not that big a deal in a Phoenix back in 1951. <laughs> and uh and, and Saint Lynn uh uh Saint Lynn had uh underwritten this project. He said, you know, well, we bought the goat dairy and the goat dairy had like 20 goats and you can't really make a dairy, you can't make a profit with 20 goats, so we need 100 more and so they had 120 goats or something like that. And uh and Saint Lynn was a businessman, a very successful businessman. Uh, and so after, after they had tried to make this goat dairy work for about a year and it wasn't working and they weren't making money. And he said, you know, uh, we just have to close this up. This is, this is not, not a good business. And so we just let it go. So they sold the goats and closed the dairy, but they still had the center there. So, so while Roy was there for the next two years, when he was, uh, served as a minister, uh, there wasn't a dairy, a goat. There weren't any goats to take care of. He didn't have to milk the goats and take care of them. He could just be there and be quiet and, of course, serve the needs of the individuals who would come, do the Sunday services. And so in this manner, he spent the next two years. And then in 1954, uh, he said, he said, I had this thought, you know, I've been, I was raised on a farm. When I'm 18 years old, I come across the country and I've been in this monastery and, and really kind of by myself in Phoenix um, for the next four years. And I have no idea how the world works. And I, have no, I mean, what it's like to be out there. And so, so this calling, this impulse to sort of get connected with the world came to him. And he chose to leave the monastic order, to leave uh, SRF and to go out on his own. And when he did this, he had an understanding with St. Lynn, who was now the president of the board of Self-Realization Fellowship, and Diamata, who was the executive secretary, Fay Wright at the time. 
the understanding was that he would go and he had decided he wanted to become a chiropractor so he'd have a business, have income, and uh, start a center, an SRF center in Denver, right here, you know? And so, uh, so this was his plan. And so he left, uh, left SRF and he said, as long as I was a minister with SRF, I was exempt from the draft. As soon as I left the ministry, I got a letter from the draft board that said, uh, come down, we want to talk to you, boy. And so he went down to the draft board and they said, they said, well, son, uh, you know, you're you past the physical, everything's fine. And he, he asked, he said, well, uh, what happens next? Am I, when will I be called up? And they said, oh, you could be called up next month. Or you could never be called up. We don't know. It just depends. And so he said, well, uh, what's, you know, what are my alternatives? And they said, well, you can sign up for two years and then it's over. And so he decided that he would do that. He would go into a non-combat, uh, as, actually as a medic, and spend his time at Fort Riley, Kansas, mostly, and got the two years out of the way so it wouldn't be hanging over his head. By the time that he mustered out from the army in two years, St. Lynn had just passed. And when St. Lynn passed, the board of directors for Self-Realization Fellowship decided, number one, that they would not have any more representatives, no more ministers, no more representatives of SRF that were not monastics. So if you weren't a monk and, you know, part of the mother center, then you couldn't represent SRF. And so they sent it, and, and Roy had started to advertise that he would do a you know, meditation class and direct disciple of Paramahansa Yogananda. And, and shortly after that, he got a letter from their lawyer, which said, you must cease and desist. You cannot use Yogananda's image or claim that you are part of Yogananda's history or anything. And he said, well, that's interesting. And... Uh, and, and apparently later he found out he had a, he, he always had a good relationship with uh, Diamada and found out later that this was a decision the board had made after St. Lynn passed. And she said, we really didn't handle that very well, did we? <laughs> and he said, well, you know, it was a little challenging. But what it did was it motivated him to just begin his ministry. So instead of becoming a chiropractor and funding a center and all that. He just, he said, well, you know, my instruction from my guru was to teach. This is what I know to teach. And so he began his independent ministry. And as an independent ministry, it, it consisted of a suitcase in one hand and a portable typewriter in the other hand and a bus ticket in the pocket. And so he began to travel from city to city and do lectures and offer classes. And he would commonly travel to 50 cities every year around in America and, um, and had traveled. By the time I met him in 1970, uh, he had been to 100 cities in America. And he had also been invited to Japan uh, to speak over there for Sachio Noie, uh, Masaharu Taniguchi's organization. Uh, Masaharu Taniguchi came to this country the first time, and because Roy had been kind of on the circuit, speaking at unity churches, yoga centers, <clears throat> um, new thought centers, so he'd been been around many places, and he had many contacts, and uh, he met one of uh, Masaharu Taniguchi's representatives, and they said, can you help us to make some contacts because he's coming to this country and he needs some places to speak. And, and so Roy said, sure, no problem. And he helped put, put them together and began the, the, you know, the, the organizational interaction in, the, in North America. Well, and he had a chance to meet Masaharu Taniguchi while he was here. And so they were so thankful for this that they invited Roy to come to Japan and do talk there. They translated a couple of his books into uh, Japanese and then took him on a tour of, <clears throat> excuse me, of uh, the, all the major cities in Japan. So he went from one place to another to another. And Sachi Noie is a big 
uh, you know, several million followers. So they would have thousands and thousands of people at each one of these venues. And, and so he was very, very well uh, liked there, very popular, and they had a very good relationship. Uh, and so when he came back, he wrote a book, a, a biography of Masaharu Taniguchi called The Miracle Man of Japan. And this book uh, made its way to a group in Brazil, and the group in Brazil made the connection with Sachio Noie, and so that sort of opened up uh, South America for them. And eventually, uh, Roy was invited to South America, to Brazil, to speak there. And he was also he was invited to uh, Germany. He did programs in Germany and Italy, uh, Canada, England. And so uh, he set up kind of a tour where he would go every few years and travel um, to these different locations. And his books were translated into, I think, 11 different languages now, uh, including uh, in India. So, so the group in India that translated his books invited him to come back there and go on a tour to promote his books in India. And uh, in a word about his books, um, he decided his, his commitment um, when he started his ministry was, I'm never going to charge for anything I do. There will never be a fee. Everything's on a donation basis. I am a servant. I show up to serve, to share what I have learned, to share my consciousness. And I do that freely. And I don't expect anything for it. Because I know that the universe provides everything I need. See? So everything is a gift. And he said, you know, it turns out to be amazing that if you allow the universe to take care of things and to direct what you're doing, it always works perfectly, you know? And not only does it work perfectly, but we usually end up with more prosperity than if we had had a, a, an actual number, you know, so much for admission. Um, so this was always his way. When he published books, if you ever see Roy's books, or if you go to our website and look online, um, his books are $5, $7, you know, for a paperback book. Um, because because we know as publishers, it, does, it only costs a couple bucks to have a book made. You know, if you get, if you get large quantities, a dollar a piece maybe. So he would always be fussing about how much books cost out there. You have to pay $25 for a book? It only costs him 57 cents to make it, you know? So, so his books were always <clears throat> part of his ministry. <clears throat> and because Center for Spiritual Awareness always was the publisher for his books, and he is the, the CEO and the director of Center for Spiritual Awareness. He's not allowed to benefit from the sale of the things that he's generating. So, so all the income from the books and the CDs and DVDs, all this, um, they just go to help pay for the cost of the, the printing and shipping and to help keep the organization going. But he never makes, he never made any money, no royalties off of anything. He must have written probably 80 or 90 books like Paramahansa Ji. Um, they don't sleep. They just write and share all this wonderful, wonderful uh, consciousness with us. Um, and the books that are translated into other languages, his books in India, because it's difficult to move money back and forth between countries. So the books that he sells in India, the money from that is donated to uh, a couple of uh, an orphanage and to a couple of organizations there. Uh, the money stays in the country wherever the translation is to help fund whatever uh, service is uh, available and opportunities there. So he was just generous this way. Uh, we would go have seminars, programs, and so we bring, you know, a couple of big tables full of books to sell and CDs and DVDs and have all this out. And at the break, halfway through, we have a break and people come and they buy and get everything that they need so they can have the book signed and take them home. And then at the end, after we have a Kriya initiation and the program's all over, Roy says, we don't want to pack these books up and carry them home. So if you didn't get one, <coughs> excuse me, if you didn't get a book, take one. You know, 
And if you have a friend at home that wants one, take two. So, so it, it's, it's a ministry, it's a sharing, it's a feeding, you see. And so this was his approach, his uh, attitude about his ministry service was always about sharing, always about giving, always about making a useful contribution. Uh, and so this was a really amazing example for us, you know, to be able to have, have this uh, individual who was so focused and so grounded. Um, I, I, uh, he invited me to come and work with him back in 1978. I moved from California to Georgia, of all places. Um, but it turned out to be the most beautiful part of Georgia, up in the very beginning of the Appalachian Mountains, Smoky Mountains. Um, so I was invited there in 78 to work with him at his Center for Spiritual Awareness, his retreat center, which uh, they had just, it actually established it in 1972, but they had just built the big meditation hall and dining hall and really started having a, a, a focused retreat schedule in 1977. So this was a year later. And, uh, and I came out to, to participate and to, and to work with him there. And so this became his headquarters, his center from which he would uh, go, still go on the road. He was still heading out and talking to 50 cities every year. So he'd be at the center with us for a couple months and then he'd be on the road for a month and back and forth. Um, and the way he, uh, the way this unfolded for him, Center for Spiritual Awareness is uh, situated on 11 acres now, originally 10 acres. And uh, when he first started, when he was first young and he was just beginning his ministry, he had this vision of a retreat center here in Denver. And he had an architect draw up plans based on his design, draw up plans for what this building would look like in this retreat center. And then he sort of put the word out and looked for support and, you know, get some, some energy going behind this. And there wasn't any. Not, you know, nobody was interested, uh, wasn't happening. And so that kind of went on the back burner. <clears throat> and so in 1970, uh, he was living in Florida, down in uh, Treasure Island, Florida. In 1970, he did a retreat or did a, a program, a seminar in Atlanta. And in Atlanta, he met a couple at his program, and the fellow was uh, publishing. He had a printing company and also a publishing business that he had started. And he said to Roy, he said, you know, you, your books are wonderful. Um, how about letting me be your publisher? Because to that, at that time, Roy was self-publishing. He, he was, you know, writing, designing, doing everything, sending it off to a printer, getting the books back, carrying them around in his trunk, you know, to sell them. And, and he was his own business, you know, his own uh, publishing company. So, so this fellow, Ed O'Neill said, how about letting us be your publisher and we'll give you good royalties and we'll take care of shipping the books to the bookstores and, you know, everything that you need. And then you don't have to worry about that. We'll print them and take care of that. And so Roy said that was a good deal. So they made an arrangement and uh, they started to do this uh, printing and publishing. Well, the publishing company was actually kind of the, the, the support outreach of a group of people who had moved from Florida up to North Georgia to create sort of a spiritual community. And the spiritual community, the group, uh, had kind of devolved into just a couple of people. The property they bought was 10 acres. And when they bought it, it was Cool Springs Acres. And so they wanted to keep this CSA acronym. And so they, uh, they founded this, the nonprofit corporation was Christian Spiritual Alliance, CSA. So the Christian Spiritual Alliance is the nonprofit corporation. And, and then by 1972, Ed said, Roy, you know, we have a nonprofit religious corporation and we have no religion. We have no teacher. 
you know, it's become the business of this printing company, which was supposed to fund the ministry and turned out to just be a hobby for Ed O'Neill. And so they said, well, why don't you come up and you can be like a teacher. You can be the, the spiritual center here. And Roy said, well, as long as I have autonomy, as long as I have free reign to do my thing and not, you know, what you guys are doing, then that's fine. So he was invited to come up and take over the teaching department. And from there, they put in some guest houses and then built a meditation hall. And the, the processes unfolded sort of naturally. Uh, they've never, never borrowed any money. Every project has always been funded before uh, the need was to be able to uh, put the buildings together and create the next thing. And so when I was there in, in 1978, and within the first year, um, the fellow who was running the printing company, Ed O'Neill, had decided that he just wanted to be a publisher. He didn't even want to run the printing plant. So he had a full printing plant, big presses, bindery, making paperback books, doing all this, all this stuff, and a dozen employees. And they were about $100,000 in debt. And, um, and so... So it was like, well, what are we going to do with this printing business? So temporarily, Roy put me in charge of running the printing business, which I was a photographer, so that wasn't really anything I was trained for. But okay, you know, we can sure I can do that. So uh, so we kept this going long enough, kept the employees working, and paid off some of the debt, but it was way too much, and it was a distraction. And so after a couple of years, Roy said, we just need to sell this, and get it off the property and get back to the work that we're about, our ministry. And so the equipment was all sold, the, the printing business, and uh, that, that uh, building was turned into our office and warehouse space, which is where we are now. So, and Ed O'Neill finally was the last, sort of the last holdout. He left, and that left Mr. Davis in charge of the responsible for um, the whole corporation, the property, the buildings, the debt. Um, so we it took a while to, to pay off that debt. Um, and of course, selling the printing uh, business helped somewhat. Um, and so everything was free, free and clear. And CSA, which is Roy's department, Center for Spiritual Awareness, still the CSA, um, uh, continues on as a retreat center and as the headquarters for Mr. Davis and uh, the warehouse and distribution point for his books and the place where we publish the magazines and do all the work. Uh, when I started, came back to work with him in 2003, I had lived there and worked for five years and then had to, had to make a living again, had to make some money and have take care of family and and then in 2003, I moved back full time and not on the property, but living nearby. And uh, we've worked uh, right next to each other since then. And I had this little game I would play with myself. I would try to get into work before Mr. Davis. And he has his office was in a little chalet and, the, and I was down in the main office building. But I could look out my window and through the trees, I could see the, the little chalet and I could see whether the light was on in there. If he was there. And so I would try to get in and, you know, four, five o'clock in the morning, he's already there. Four thirty, he's already there. I could never get there before Mr. Davis. He was there working early, early, early. And he used to say, you know, get up early in the morning, meditate. It's quiet. The phones don't ring. There's no distractions. You can get your... Your important work done first, you know, get this taken care of, and then the rest of it takes care of itself. Get up early and take care of what you need to take care of while you can do it. And then if you have trouble getting up early, it's no problem. Just go to bed earlier. You know, there's nothing happening after nine o'clock that's that interesting that can stand in the way between you and your life, you know, your real life. So whatever's happening on Buffy the Vampire Slayer tonight, <laughs> you know, we can actually do without that. And so he would go to bed. His, his bedtime was between 7.30 and 8, and he would be up at 4 o'clock in the morning every day, every day. And he would travel. Of course, he was invited internationally, traveled a lot, and he would travel, 
uh, internationally. And when we went to, I remember we went to India, I mean to Italy for the Kriya Yoga Congress we had several years ago. And he sort of reluctantly agreed to come three days early. We would go usually at least a day early to just be rested um, for a two day program. Sort of reluctantly agreed to go three days early so we might be able to see a little bit of Milan. Um, and the devotees there had arranged for us to go see the the uh, Last Supper, the actual painting of the Last Supper. So, so he showed up for that. And then the next morning after the program's over, we're on the plane again. Um, there's no sightseeing, no tourists. It's like we have to get back to work, you know. And things like Christmas and Thanksgiving were kind of interrupting his life. He said, well, okay, we'll take the day off. But... <laughs> But his ministry was his life. This is what he did. This was what was important to him. And he really didn't understand why everybody didn't feel like they had a purpose in life and wasn't focused on fulfilling that purpose. He said, we all have two main purposes. One is to be awake, liberation of consciousness, self and God realization. This is number one purpose that we're here for. Number two purpose is you know, in, peculiar to us. Each one of us has a different interest and a different predilections and we're wired up a different way. But each of us has a purpose, some role to fulfill in the grand scheme of things. And, and if we can find that purpose, if we're living on purpose, then we're happy, usually pretty healthy. We're, we're fired up in the morning. We can't wait to get back to it. And we have to drag ourselves away at night. You know, this is living on purpose. And so we should be accomplishing our purposes, what we're here for, what really makes our hearts sing. Those are my words, not his. He didn't talk like that. Um, uh, but what really gets us fired up and then, um, and then focusing on our spiritual path, our spiritual awakening path is ultimately the most important thing. If we have that together, everything else falls in place all the grace, all the support, all the nurturing. And my story about how he got to where he was, he never did anything to make that happen. You know, he was invited, 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 the universe came together, the support was there. Like Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, I do nothing. I do nothing, and nothing remains undone. I mean, we can live this way. I don't have to force the universe to be the way I think it should be. I don't have to push things around. I don't have to push the people around me, the relationships, the environment. It's an organic process that's naturally unfolding out of itself. If I cooperate with it, it's perfect. And I'm taken care of, and I'm guided and led. And wow, what a blessing. You know, bless him. So, uh, so this is the uh, the inspiration, the guidance, the uh, example uh, that Mr. Davis set for us. For those who are uh, plugged in and who notice what he has to say, and of course he's so so very grounded and straightforward in his approach it's not doesn't it's not rocket science it's like this is very simple and straightforward and you know if people of average intelligence and uh a little bit of interest and motivation in taking care of themselves uh can be successful it takes a little longer for some but it's okay we've got time we have time we're here as long as we continue to make to move forward one step at a time, little by little, is what uh, Lahiri Baba would say, you know, a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit here, pretty soon we've accomplished, you know, we're there. Little baby steps. And so we can do that. And I would love to tell you my story, but it would take more than five minutes. Uh, I was, you know, a young guy. I was 20, 23, just turned 23 years old in California. Uh, about 45 minutes south of Haight-Ashbury in the, and graduated from high school in 65. By 67, the summer of love, I was totally enchanted with all that was going on there. And at the same time, uh, there was a, 
a restraining clip, something inside of me that said, no, you can't do that. You can't just quit. You can't be a hippie. You can't go on the road with your $10 Mexican guitar and, you know, sing your way across the country because I couldn't sing. Um, but so there was this struggle inside, you know, Arjuna and the Bhagavad Gita is like torn between do I do my duty or do I go and do what feels right and fun, like fun, you know, what's the easy thing? And so I grew up with that, was in that kind of place, and I wasn't looking for anything. I wasn't suffering. Most people come to our to a path because of suffering. I wasn't. I was drinking beer, racing motorcycles, trying to keep my old Corvette together, and having you know the crazy California lifestyle, and and suffering. You know, I had a lot of challenges, but uh, but it was just kind of interest <clears throat> interesting. And by 1970, I was 23, and I had a steady job, an apartment, a wife, a life, and things were kind of stabilized and grounded. And the universe conspired to bring me to the place where I would be able to meet a representative of Mr. Davis. Um, and when I say conspired, we are there is an innate impulse that we have, the soul has to be awake. There's an innate impulse in every one of us that is driving us, that is directing us, that will not allow us to be content with anything less than awakening, right? So, and so this is directing. So I didn't have, I wasn't looking for anything. It came to me. So this fellow comes into my photo lab and says, can you take my picture? I want to, I want to need a poster. I'm going to teach a meditation class. I thought, oh, what's meditation? You know, what's that about? And so he invites me to his study group on a weekly study group and gives me one of Mr. Davis's books. And I thought, wow, this is a course. This makes perfect sense. Why didn't they tell me this in school? You know, and so so I was hooked. My life turned 90 degrees and I began my awakening path and my um, uh, my opportunity to see everything that I was doing as spiritual. My life was literally every decision everything we had a spiritual dimension to it and it does and so so i've been blessed to be guided and to be led and to be you know, invited from one thing to another uh throughout my lifetime and it's been a wild ride and most of the time i have no idea what's happening next i've learned to to just sort of step out into the unknown where it's scary, but it's okay. You know, faith. We know that everything's in divine order and we're taken care of. It's true. true. I mean, it's been true for me for 70 years. And well, not 70 years, I was 23. So it's been true for me for 49 years. And I can sit here and testify to the fact that uh, this works. You know, we just trust. Put ourselves in the way of the way of, of the way the universe is unfolding, the, the harmonious dharma, and we are taken care of, supported, nurtured, even though we haven't got a clue how it's going to work. It does. You know? So we did it in four and a half minutes. Thank you. Uh, anything? A Thirty-second question. Thank you so much for your attention and for the opportunity to be here and. And for the fact that you are all, um, it, it's all, it's, it's wonderful to see people who are investing in themselves. You know, this is, this is really self-love when you'll take the time and put the energy and the attention into doing this for yourself. You know, this is really remarkable. So blessings. Thank you.